Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dennis. I'll be your host for the session today. We're here uh, to discuss a very interesting topic. It's called uh, product management in times of growth. Um, as we all know, um, yeah, scaling your business and especially product departments is probably one of the uh, yeah, more difficult things to do. Um, I'll actually keep it very short. Um, my task today is to uh, monitor the chat. Um, so please ask lots of questions and um, we'll forward them to the speakers um, at the end of the talk. And otherwise, um, Tama will be your moderator um, today. And um, yeah, enjoy the session. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, yes, as Dennis mentioned already, we're going to talk about how product management needs to be done in times of growth. I mean, product management in itself is extremely hard, but the moment the company starts to grow and grow massively, um, the challenge becomes a different game. And for that, I have a very light round here um, of people who actually went through that growth phase and didn't fuck it up. Right, at least all these companies are still there um, and growing like crazy, which is amazing. So um, let me just like start by introducing our guest today. And I would like to start with Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian Zubel is um, the director of product management at Homeday. And Homeday is a real estate company in Germany, um, digitalizing the entire home buying and selling experience. And he joined Home Day in 2017 when the company was about 30 people big. And they grew it over the time to 250 people in the core team, plus 200 people um, as realtors who needs to be counted in as well. So they had like 150% year over year growth from 2019 to 2020, which is amazing. Um, my next guest is uh, Faust Maglia. He is CPO from Casavo, and Casavo is also in the real estate uh, business and originally running the so-called iBuyer model, which is um, buying properties and then selling it in, again in the market and not brokering it directly. And now after expanding a lot in Italy, they're now growing also internationally. And there they grew this, um, the team from five product contributors to over 70 today. And they showed a four X increase during the last year in terms of um, uh, revenue. And he joined actually 2018, um, but first of all, in the uh, position of a head of marketing and then uh, moving over um, to become the CPO of that company. Um, so with us today is also Simon Brugger. Um, and Simon is working um, for Spryker. And Spryker is a e-commerce software that hopefully outperforms all the shopwares and magantos of the world because it's a pain. Um, and they have been now 400 employees and growing each year 100% um, in terms of employees. And he's been with the company since 2018. So also been through a big part of the journey where the company grew a lot. Um, and then we have uh, Rob Krasowski with us. Um, he is VP product at a company called Dixa. And Dixa is a customer service platform where they're just going to put the customer more into the center instead of just like doing customer service. Um, and they doubled their um, product and engineering organization over the last three years and um, went from two teams uh, to more than eight product teams right now and looking to expand even further with their new uh, 105 million series C round. Um, and uh, Rob is fairly comparably new to that company, uh, so he joined in 2020. And last but not least, we have um, Philip Jonas, um, and he is working at um, Sender, which is a so-called digital freight forwarder, so making sure that all the Amazon packages that we actually get at home is somewhere getting to our home, so we don't need to pick it up somewhere, uh, and doing the, the logistics and the technology behind the logistics uh, in there. Um, yes, he is the VP of product, and they grew amazingly from, um, from 2019 till now, from 200 FTEs to 900 FTEs, and the tech team from 30 to 200 people, and from two to 22 product teams, and from one to eight offices, which is just like mind-blowing. And he also joined in uh, June 2020. All right, cool. Um, so I would like to start with the most important part of any product organization. I think these are the people that are actually working in, in the product organization. So um, Sebastian, 
what kind of people do you actually need in order to be able to deal with this type of growth? Which kind of mindsets do you need? What are you looking for when you are actually hiring people in this product organization? Yeah. So we're talking from, from the experiences that we, we made, right? As a small company that wants to grow, you are not obviously in a position where you attract the product icons, you know, the, 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 the big, the, the, big phases of product management and you need to hire for, I think for entrepreneurial people who have the my, right mindset, who are willing to grow, who are kind of structured in their thinking, but also entrepreneurial and can be hands-on and get their hands dirty. I think this is an early phase, what you, what you must have. And then you can coach them into what product management actually means and grow with the company and grow their, their skills as well. Um, but this, I think was 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 the the key to enabling this growth. Um, not having people who are very set in how is product management done and super experienced, but rather higher potential. And obviously, you need then to accompany that with the right knowledge and the right coaching to to bring people there. But isn't that a big problem to have? You know, like this entrepreneurial mindset people, and then putting them in an organization where you probably need a lot of structure, but where this kind of mindset might not you know, it'd be the thing that they can live by on a day-to-day -day business, or is that wrong? Totally. You can't have all of them to be totally wild and entrepreneurial. <laughs> that would also not work. You need some people keeping the structure in place and um, giving a, raising a hand, basically, when things get, they get too crazy and coach them really on product management, what it means, right? But people who are eager to learn will actually suck up this knowledge quite fast. And there are so many good knowledge sources out there, um, in these days that this is actually quite easy. You need, you need talented people, smart people, people hungry to grow, and they will figure it out. This, this is my stand on it. So what do you actually do in order to coach these people? How do you onboard them? What do you, what do you tell them? What do you say? Do you say like, hey, this is your project, go ahead, just like try to figure out your way? Or do you have a very structured approach to just like teach them the basics of product management up to uh, whatever they need in the future? Actually, the moment I give them an offer, I sent them inspired the book and tell them before you start, you please read that and, and know all of what's, what's, what's in there. So this is the first step. <laughs> then second step is basically uh, writing an onboarding plan. So we always have these 30 days onboarding plans. And usually they say it takes six months for a product manager to get onboarded, but I think it can be faster. You just need a very structured plan linking to all your resources, knowledge resources internally, connecting them to the right people up front or right, right, right in the beginning and um, then, then they will, will get to work. And then obviously continuously you have the one-on-ones with them here where you speak about experiences, support them and what they do and give them hints, especially to juniors. For others, it's then more a coaching situation and, and a discussion on eye level, what, what should happen uh, and how can they improve and what can they improve about the product. So PJ, like how does this kind of onboarding of product people, training product people actually look like at, at Sender or how do you want to shape it uh, if you don't ha have it set up yet? Yeah, that uh, I can only uh, relate to what Sebastian was already telling. You, you need to set it up and almost codify it in a way that it's reproducible. So what we now really try to do is have structured documentation on what a product manager he or she needs to know and do. That starts with our values. That starts with how overall the company uh, prioritizes and what's the strategy, how we prioritize, what are the tools needed and what tools we have at hand, um, such that he or she is right away capable of uh, being or is set up for success. Um, and then most importantly, what's his or her mission, basically, what is like basically the scope he or she should thrive in and put these people as soon as possible in the driver's seat uh, to really um, get started. And I think also 30 days is enough to get onboarded. <laughs> uh, PJ, how do you balance between giving the people hard skills that they actually need in order to perform their job versus just giving them, let's say, a North Star, a mission, a direction, and try to find them the, the, the way themselves? The thing, what we learned over time is um, when you have plenty of product teams working side by side, you need to be really clear on scope. 
Um, otherwise, you have overlaps and you have duplication of work, right? So that scope needs to be defined, but properly defined in a way that you still can thrive and you're not so bounded. So here, I think we make sure that this is, this is, this is visible there. And then um, with regards to hard skills, we, we make sure that to see what are the hard skills required and pretty early on see where there may be gaps. We are openly embracing gaps with regards to uh, hard skills and soft skills. And then we try um, to give feedback each other, right? To, to expose them. We have an internal mentoring program up to the point that we have um, learning L and D budget to support people with the uh, personal growth they need to be successful. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, I mean, the moment you get more people, you probably not only grow within the product team, but in the rest of the organization. And this definitely needs to have some, some, some structure. Um, so, so Fausto, maybe from your side, um, I mean, you've been also through, through a hyper growth phase or are still in hyper growth, if you want to say it like that one. How do you actually build up the structural organization? How do you make sure that all these, let's say, individual mindsets actually work together in some kind of way? So, so what are your principles around that? Yeah, uh, I wanted to highlight, Tamer, as you said at the beginning, that we are still growing, actually, still going through that. So we are still able to fuck up. Uh, in some ways. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyways, <laughs> to answer your question, um, you know, we, we have these, uh, starting from uh, the literature and what uh, very experienced people and very knowledgeable people uh, have seen uh, during their careers, we created these uh, or organizational model that we call uh, a fractal model so that we have very clear structures that replicate themselves and that are uh, very audience oriented. Um, so we see a lot of value in really empowering the product teams. That's also why we don't have that many uh, product management roles. Actually, we see it at two different levels. We have product managers. We don't have many in the company. And then we have product management skills. Uh, that we value in each and every member of our uh, product teams, right? Because in the end, if you can get uh, backend developers to understand product management, then uh, you can see a uh, really great value there. Um, so uh, this is a bit it. I think the key to it is to really focus uh, on the customers and have people dedicated to uh, a specific customer. In our case, we have more than one. Can you give us some examples about the skills that you want to be um, within the, and, and I'm purpose saying this product organization, not meaning specifically product managers? Yeah, uh, I mean, we are looking for everything that can contribute to the creation of a successful product. Uh, it also depends on the stage of growth of the product and what the challenges are, but this can span from front-end development to Backend development, of course, UX UI design, UX research, product management, business understanding, UX writing, really everything. So ideally, you should have everything uh, in one person. Mm -hmm. You can have that, of course. Uh, so you need... Uh, Good uh, luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you need uh, more people and, and the number of people... Um, varies of course what i'm seeing is that um product contributors as we like to call them and especially developers are not very um especially the more experienced one are not very open to this way of working but what i can see is that the more uh, a product team achieve results the more they see value in extending uh, their skills And what I'm seeing down the road is that we could get to smaller, um, uh, a smaller number of people within a specific product team because they can cover a wider range of skills. Cool. Fausto, you mentioned this kind of concept of um, fractal organizations, um, which like, like as I interpret this one is, let's say a reproducible pattern that you can apply depending on the size that you're actually in. And my core question to this one is now, 
are you dealing with structural changes reactively? So waiting till you get more people till it becomes a pain till you then actually change the structure? Or do you already prepare and have the outlook and prepare a structure for a team that is actually might not be there already? Um, let's say we try to grow organically. So what, what uh, we want to do um, every time we add one person to the organization is to put him or her in an existing product team and grow that product team until it, it grows too, too big. And therefore we have to split it. In this way, what you get is a natural uh, contamination of culture uh, processes, way of working, knowledge about the business. And since we uh, look for these um, really cross-functional product teams, what you get in the end is flexibility. Meaning that if we need to refocus the priorities of the company from one audience to another one, we can just move a product team uh, from here to there. Of course, here, people resist change a little bit. So the first time you do that to a team, it's horrible uh, and they need a lot of support and people caring and so on. But then uh, they start uh, getting used to it. Cool, thank you very much. Um, I would like to jump over to the topic on how to actually um, create a process out of the entire thing. So. Um, but before we actually jump into this one, Simon, what were from your side the biggest challenges that you had in terms of how you actually built the product um, in this kind of, let's say, in, in, the, in your personal environment, in your personal experience? Yeah, from uh, Spraka's perspective, um, we had a quite of a history, right, when we started or entering the, the market of uh, commerce technology. There were already established players, right, 10 years ahead with feature development and already features uh, um, established. So at the new kit on the block, you, our first days was just really feature focused, right? So let's get the obvious commerce features out of the box. So it was more kind of a product owner driven delivery focused organization. And during this growth of, the, um, of our product and the, the maturity uh, and feature completeness of our product, we need to transform this organization into a real yeah, product customer centric organization, product management organization, where we need to um, establish more processes uh, about taking care of the product, right? Establishing a product life cycle, thinking about end of life of specific features, right? Before that, we was only thinking about adding more, adding more, adding more. And now turning this shift and, and making this transition from a yeah, so-called feature factory towards uh, a product, real product organization uh, is, is quite of the biggest challenge in the last couple of years. So, so currently, if I look around, um, I see a lot of nodding heads saying <laughs> like, oh, we need to get away from feature factory to to actually being more customer centric. Um, and let me just like ask a very provocative question um, and anyone can feel free to raise his voice if he wants to say something about it. Why do you actually need that? I mean, why can't you just like continue with delivering feature? I mean, like it worked in the first days. Why does this stop to work and, and why do you want to change about it? I think we have like a, a super similar situation, right? Where we're also uh, a up and comer in, in our uh, industry and we're chasing incumbents, right? Who, who are far ahead of us. If, if we just go after the same sort of functionality that, that those incumbents have, we will create features right into our own grave, right? We have to fundamentally change the, the goal that we're trying to achieve with our product. And to do that, you need real product people who are, are looking for opportunities in the problems that customers have and, and the ability to deliver a unique and differentiated uh, solution to those problems. Uh, otherwise, the, the company is just dead in the water. So for, for me, that has, has to be the focus. It has to come from product. It can't come from, from sales chasing a, a feature list on someone else's website. Okay, um, I'm not sure who was first. Sebastian, maybe you go next. Yeah, just want to say we also went through this phase of being rather feature factory and now uh, in the last years moved more towards the empowered team model. And I think 
that's not so harmful. Um, I think the reason why we move towards empowered teams is because the feature factory model is not scalable. And um, it depends too much on single heads and single people to really think things through and uh, make sure it makes sense. So long term, the empowered team model produces better results. But I think the feature team model can also on a small scale re uh, produce good results and even faster. And maybe because I heard this now several times, uh, it's actually necessary in the beginning of a, of a company to do that. This is controversial, but we did that and it seemed to have worked. Now we deal with it, also challenges to get to the empowered team model. Um, and I think it's worth it still um, in the early phase to be faster and still deliver outcome and output. Yeah, uh, this might be necessary. Simon, maybe you're going to... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, why, why should you do this? Because usually, if you, if you build your product, if you build all these features, right? Usually, you, if, you do it, uh, if you do this good, right? You also get customers, right? <laughs> And as long as, as soon as you get customer, then you should implement, uh, or you need, must definitely implement these customer-centric um, processes in, in, in touch points to, to listen to them, to adapt your product, to build a strategy, because customers are also demanding in every good relationship is always a kind of a give and take, right? You need information from the customer and the customer wants to have also the strategy and your vision, how you think further uh, your product vision and what are the next steps, the next releases, how do you want to, to change the product strategy most likely and all this stuff. And I think that is a, a pretty important part. And here in, At Spryker, we also have a kind of a special situation because we have, on the one hand side, product managers we are, which are taking care of the core product, uh, the commerce platform. And on the other side, we have also a professional service team who are doing directly the, the, pro, uh, the project with the customer and implementing the technology on customer sites. And here we have in the product uh, management team, product managers sitting next to the customer acting in the projects as product owners and get real world insights of how our product is applied and used on the customer side, right? Mm -hmm. So that we can also get direct feedback from our own colleagues working with the customer together, um, establishing the, um, the, uh, the, the technology and in introducing Spryker on, 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 on customer side, which is really important and valuable. And that are actually the most Uh, in most important feedback what we what we uh, receive to steer the product. So the customer talking to the customer is actually the the big one voice that you should listen to in order to build your product into the right direction. Um, uh, PJ, what's your take on that? And I would then also would like to move on to how do you make this actually work? Because you know, like moving from let's say feature factory to a customer centric company is not an easy thing because there's tons of people out there who might not going to have this, let's say, product thinking, product skills, being able to actually take that shift. How do you actually do that? Um, I think it's with a lot of education. Quite naturally, if you have a company where there are um, a large part is in, um, located in the ops or in the business side, they have in their mind already all the features they want and they just throw them over the fence and say, I want this feature, right? And as a product manager, what you need to do then is carefully listen um, what are actually their needs and what they really want to achieve with it and then go with them in, into like a process of figuring out what is really the right prioritization and always, always involve also uh, the end customer to it, right? And here's another thing in the end, uh, you have to balance both, both sides that... Um, You, you know what the business wants, but also ultimately your customer, what he or she is, uh, what, what are their problems and their needs. Um, and also educate your product managers. It's not about shipping features, right? You don't want, uh, not all the time. You want to ship outcomes. You want to delight customers. Um, and then um, this makes a true product successful without diluting the uh, without diluting the value proposition right because in the end if you have all these features what is then your product it's like everything and then it's hard to use it's complex and then you are just again one of all these other products with no real edge no real uh, usp 
Um, and that's really where you have to rather say no than yes to a lot of things. All right. What, what else can you do beyond of, or what else do you do and beyond of like educating the people trying to move the ship around? Sebastian, maybe you. I think it's a lot about team collaboration and yes, collaboration with stakeholders as well. But I would like to speak about collaboration in the team um, because uh, there's a lot of trust needed between those players. And um, Fausto said everybody should have some skills on, on all levels. This is a good idea. Um, I think when you, when you hire people, you have certain expertise that you hire and people have to trust each other's expertise to do each other's job well. So it's basically cl clarifying those roles, setting expectations, what we expect from those roles, the product manager doing a proper problem discovery, the designer not only designing UI, but doing solution discovery, yeah? going, in, going also out with the customers and, and seeing what's, what creates value, not only usability. So um, clear roles and building trust in teams is crucial, but it's not easy, especially if there's a history before that. And uh, I know from the past, and I spoke about this feature factory model before, we were once in a situation shipping a CRM system in two to three months, and it left behind a lot of burned ground between product and engineers and designers. So we have to be careful with what we do in these phases where it's really rushed and really gets, gets crunchy um, so that people can, can move back to trust each other and collaborate. Simon. Yeah, what, uh, what we also learned is that uh, ed when it comes to education, there are a lot of, like, like Sebastian already said, right? There are in entrepreneur uh, mindset uh, people out there which are really humble and they know uh, or they, they are, get really fast to the standard tools and setups of, of, of product management. What we see, what is more a bigger challenge is not to educate them on, on product management due to the, a lot of materials out there. It's educating for our own product. Right. So what is our product? How does our customers are using the product? So and we started to also uh, assign the product managers uh, for uh, two weeks to customer support. Right. So they so that they sit next to the customer support uh, colleague and really get get all the feedback, all the, 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 the tickets, see what what our customers are complaining about, what they are struggling with. Right. So it's a good uh, uh, it's a really good point or a really good chance to educate the people about your product, right? And not about the product management, the product management process, all this stuff. That is also something what uh, what comes with the onboarding. But it's more important to 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 educate them for us. How, what is the product? What are customers are struggling with? What are the customers actually, right? And what problems does our customers try to solve with our product? Cool, um, Rob. I would love to jump on another topic um, because we've been talking about that the idea of empowered teams is something that is a, let's say a common ground, common sense because the centralized organization won't scale in that way. How do you actually make sure that the entire company is running into the same direction? I mean, now you have like 20 different product people looking for some customer interviews and potential opportunities that they can chase. How do you do that? I, I think it, it comes down to having having agreement on uh, one, a, a singular vision. Uh, so being really steadfast and, and dedicated and vocal about the, the vision for your product. So everybody knows the end result that we're trying to achieve. And then you have to measure success the right way. So the way we measure success is it's not in the number of features that we create, right? It's the amount of, of value that we create in the, in the product. And we tie that to business level problems, right? So uh, when we look at what we're trying to do across our product teams, we are looking to solve business level issues, uh, not, not kind of singular um, or, or siloed projects, right? Um, so I think that is, is a great way to keep everybody pointed in the, the same direction. Uh, it's by, by giving them the right outcomes uh, to create uh, and not focusing so much on the, the output, but staying super focused on the outcome that you're trying to produce. Cool. Um, I think there's a last topic that I would like to um, tackle on before we actually go into the Q&A session. And this is the question of how to drive innovation in terms of growth. 
right? I mean, company is growing, team structures are growing. You need to deal with a lot of operational challenges on the day-to-day -day basis. And typically there are more problems or items in the backlog or whatever that you can just like solve with whoever people you're gonna have, right? And just like rushing behind what is actually needed is probably very, very complicated, but how do you make sure if it's necessary at all, um, do you innovate in this kind of phases? And I would like to hear Faust's opinion on, on this one, because I think they're doing a lot in this field. Yeah, I think we, we have been discussing what the different stages of uh, the, the growth and empowerment of a team could be, right? We, we spoke about the feature factory, then probably comes a time where you feed the teams with the opportunities you see on the market or the problems that, that you find uh, as a product manager. And then you allow the teams to discover the problems themselves. Uh, as uh, Rob was saying, by having a common strategy and common vision, right? Um, I think at that point, you unlock the maximum potential for, for innovation. Uh, if you allow teams to discover the problems and find their own solutions. Of course, this requires a leap of faith uh, uh, in the management because you have to allow yourself to be surprised and be also disappointed sometimes because uh, the teams messed up and delivered something that was uh, not useful. But if you can see this as a process, as a path of continuous improvement and learning, then everything is fine. I think in the end, this goes back to Simon C next infinite game right if you're playing that game then failure is not an issue and you can really innovate by uh, being surprised by your teams that's how i see it awesome guys thank you very much we have eight minutes left um so i think it's gonna be time for some questions um i think dennis you're gonna throw in some questions right Yes, I'll join. Uh, I'll throw in some questions. We had some really good questions in the chat also. Uh, first of all, thanks for the really insightful talk. Um, so we have a question here from Marcel Kolmer, um, and he asked, and I think you already touched on the topic a little bit, but um, his question was around um, how to actually <clears throat> scale the amount of product teams and at the same time hold the hierarchy relatively flat. So talking about this empowered model. And at that, in, in, in line with that, there's another question that I found really interesting It ties into this. How much time do you tell your product managers to really work on short, short term kind of uh, stuff? And um, how much time do they spend on, let's say, long term strategic thinking? Anyone want to jump on that question? Maybe I can share what, what, what we are uh, doing. Uh, I don't know if I can also uh, share my screen, actually. Yes. I think, yes, you can. Is it, is it feasible? OK. Yes. I'll wait just a moment. Oh. So um, here you can see what, what I was talking about previously. Right? previously, right, the fractal model. So how are we scaling uh, hierarchy and management? We are doing it through what we call guiding coalitions. So you can see that we have squads. The squads are the ones, uh, the, the blue circles. And then we have tribes, or uh, you can call them product teams for the squads and product areas for the tribes. Then we have a central guiding coalition that essentially in our company is uh, myself, our CTO and our um, uh, agile coach. And then we have a guiding coalition for every product area. So within every product area, you find the product manager, head of product, um, uh, a, a person that is in charge of uh, taking care of the people within the squads and making sure all the skills are there and they can perform. Uh, we call this role the people care plus uh, an agile coach. And there is a, another layer actually of uh, collaboration that, that are the communities, communities of practice, because we want to make sure that 
essentially the way we do backend development is more or less the same across their entire company. So you will find people from different um, squads with the same practice, with the same vertical, such as, let's say, uh, product design that gather from time to time to discuss the challenges they have, how they're fixing them, and what new practices should be introduced in the company. Um, and every community has a leader that usually is the most experienced person in that specific practice. So we have these two different levels of uh, collaboration and let's say management or alignment around a common practice. Great, thanks a lot. Does anybody else want to um, also jump on that question? Otherwise I have uh, another couple lined up. From from our side, uh, just to mention is we we uh, we cannot just scale product management because this is something which is tightly connected um, by our product organization to other departments around us, right? And is a lot of people are involved in actually driving products at Spryker and not only product managers, right? We we try to to set up these um, uh, cross functional teams and really live this uh, in in that way. So scaling product without taking care of scaling the entire organization is, is something uh, on our side it's uh, really important that we have here a, a good balance right and uh, and this is something which is uh, uh, important when it comes to scale and maybe one addition because hierarchies were mentioned in the question i wouldn't I wouldn't worry about hierarchies so much um, i mean if you have many product managers. Yes, they need a people manager on top of them, coaching them, and so on and so forth. But the drivers of uh, the core entities of what's 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 being done are still the product managers and the squads. Yeah, uh, depending on which which model you you run. So um, the team leads should rather be empowering rather than suppressing. So I wouldn't wouldn't worry about having too many layers of hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one other question that came up from Kashama was, um, how do you cultivate the culture of okay to fail? Um, especially as companies grow, I think failure can be very expensive. So, um, but we all need to do it as product managers somehow. So how do you cultivate that kind of culture and what are some kind of techniques that you use? I think uh, encouraging people to, to fail early uh, makes a, a huge difference, right? It's It's, it's easier to fail early, uh, less expensive, and you waste a lot less time and energy. Um, I, I think for us, we're very interested in, in the way and the uh, people make decisions and the process, right? Um, and if we give them the right tools to to think about the, the product that they're creating uh, or the features, uh, right? Then as, as long as they're using those tools and they come to failure, like that, that's fine. Um, it's the, the failures that we worry about are when, um, when people are making decisions that aren't, aren't based on the kind of common alignment that we have as a business, um, because I think that's where things can, can become really costly. Um, not, not just for things that, that don't work out, but for the things that actually live in your product forever that, uh, become a persistent problem because they're not aligned with the, the rest of the product vision and strategy. Yeah, Sebastian, I think you were first. Yeah, just very concrete technique to use is the postmortems. So th things will break, failures will be done. And it's important to, to speak about that without any judgment in the room. So involve the people that, or collect the people who are involved in the failure, uh, reconstruct how it, how it came to be, reflect what can be done better in the future. And this should be done by the people responsible and not somebody on top who judges them. And then they can speak about these things, suggest measures for improvement and execute them. And you can still document that and read them for further purposes. So everybody, the whole organization can benefit from that failure, but uh, it's, an, it's a really fail failure culture. It's okay. Makes a lot of sense. Simon, any additions to that? Yeah, this failure culture, culture is uh, important. And I think way more important is to really know when you actually failed right so because what we realize in daily businesses is always this failing is a vague term right and you can always discuss is when is the right tipping point to to stop everything or something like that right and 
and starting, and this is something we, we, we have hard times to do this often, right? To really identify the right KPIs very, very early and the success factors that we can say, okay, if this uh, situation uh, appears or we, uh, we have these kind of uh, AP, uh, KPIs reached, then um, it's a failure, right? But uh, failing uh, to, I, to define the failure really early is uh, for us really important. Philip, you had your hand raised. You put it down again, I think. I or just I wanted to add, yeah, embrace just failure in the culture. For me personally, the biggest learning I derive from failures, um, right? So if, uh, and I like this equation of Ray Dalio, he says like pain plus reflection is growth. So ultimately the more pain you have and the better you reflect. So right, the, the post-mortem is a, is a mechanism of reflecting together with the team that unlocks growth and that's the best way of learning actually. <laughs> Ooh, what a better you. way. I don't think there's a better way to end this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> closing remarks. Um, guys, thank you very much for being part of this round. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it um, as much as I did. And feel free to approach us on LinkedIn or whatever. You're probably happy. I'm, I'm hopefully speaking for the round. <laughs> but you, you, it's probably very easy to find our names there. 